Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of the state of the art of coffee fermentation. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often helpful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you three great speakers. Mario Fernandez, PhD, the Technical Officer with the Specialty Coffee Association. Felipe Ospina, CEO of the Multinational Specialty Coffee Trader, Colors of Nature Group. Uh, and Ruben Sorto, CEO of BioFortune Group, a coffee upcycled and food ingredient manufacturer based in Honduras. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them at the end. I will come back at the end to ask some of our audience questions. Uh, for now, I will turn it over to Mario for introductions. Thank you very much, Amelia. See you soon. So um, my name is Mario Fernandez. I am the technical officer at the Specialty Coffee Association. This webinar has been uh, produced in as a collaboration between both the, the Fermentation Association and the Specialty Coffee Association. So uh, on behalf of, of both organizations, I, I bid you a warm welcome today. And uh, I, will, I will give a very short and, and broad introduction about coffee fermentation be, before we uh, present our, our panelists who are really at the forefront of, of technology and, and technique in coffee fermentation. Uh, we need to start by remembering that coffee is a fermented product. Practically all the coffee we, we drink has, has been fermented uh, in one way or another. The, the thing is that um, only, only one of the many post-harvest processes actually includes a fermentation step. The other uh, post-harvest processing methods uh, involve fermentation as part of, of drying or, or during some part of, of the process without a clear explicit fermentation step. That leads people to think that only washed coffee is fermented. It, it's not the case. Washed coffee is, is the one where we have a step in which we place the coffee in, in a vat and let it ferment. Um, so having, having said that, um, all coffee is fermented, but what kind of fermentation do we have in coffee, well, it's it's definitely low technology fermentation. Um, coffee is produced by millions of small coffee producers uh, around the tropics. Um, they have very little capital to invest in fermentation equipment. Um, oftentimes, the price is too low to to for them to add fermentation controls as part of of the cost equation. Therefore, um, for most coffee, and, and, and I, I, I dare say perhaps 99.9% .9 of coffee in the world, it, it undergoes wild fermentation in which um, the, the microbes uh, grow on the, on the massive mucilage. Um, in a, in a wild fashion and, and the coffee producer or the coffee processor only controls certain, certain parameters such as the length of, of the fermentation. Usually the, the length of the fermentation is the only parameter controlled by, by a typical um, coffee producer. Aside of that, there's little or, or no control. Some, some people are, are able to control the, the volume of the coffee mass and, and the volume of the coffee mass enables uh, some level of control because, because uh, different, different masses and different geometries for the coffee mass enable for um, different um, 
therm thermodynamics within within the fermentation process, and then you can slightly control the, the temperature and the outcome. But for the most part, um, uh, some some other people control for pH. Some other people control for uh, uh, bricks degrees uh, in in the mucilage as it's being fermented. But for the most part, the only thing which is controlled is the final point of the fermentation. At what point should I uh, terminate the fermentation, right? And again, as a reminder, this only happens in washed coffee fermentation. For all the other processes, there's even less control than that. Uh, so as, as you can imagine, there is a huge room for improvement, innovation, and development in, in the realm of coffee fermentation. Uh, there's a lot that can be brought to the coffee industry from other industries which perform fermentation. And today we have uh, two examples, two great examples of, uh, of what I deem to be the forefront of coffee fermentation. On one side, uh, we have what, what I deem to be the best example of high fermentation technology adapted to coffee. That would be Ruben Sorto. Ruben is the CEO of BioFortune Group, a coffee upcycled and food ingredient manufacturing operation based in Honduras. As an innovation leader, he has developed new, new processes currently under patent application for specialty coffee production, as well as for upcycled products with high market value, creating new revenue streams for small coffee farmers. He has also focused on innovating in the coffee value chain and in other crop production with value propositions such as precision agriculture, controlled fermentation, traceability systems, and post-harvest food technology for specialty coffee production creating unique flavors and aromas, as well as nutraceutical and functional foods. One of the core strategies has been the reduction of the carbon footprint and elimination of any waste disposal, applying circular economy tactics, as well as agroforestry and microbial protection practices in the farms and simultaneously enhancing the organoleptic profile of specialty coffees by maximizing the metabolite production through microbiota mapping and process control. A Honduran citizen, Mr. Sorte holds an MBA with a specialization in industry and technology and a bachelor's degree in biochemical and food engineering. And I, I have also invited um, what I consider to be one of the best examples of adapting uh, fermentation knowledge to to the case of smallholders. Um, and um, so uh, I, I in invited Felipe Spina. But for me, Felipe's case is, is, is not an example of high technology, but it's a, a very good example of how uh, fermentation know-how can be replicated and brought to small, small scale operations. Um, as CEO of Colors of Nature Group in Japan, Colombia, Costa Rica, and USA, Felipe Ospina is a specialty coffee trader based in Tokyo, though he spends half of the year between Costa Rica and his home country, Colombia, where he works with smallholder producers in innovation projects at La Cereza Research Center in Huila. A biologist by training and always interested in, in smallholder producer education, He's also a Q processing instructor accredited by the Coffee Quality Institute. Felipe says, I believe specialty coffee can help thousands of small farmers around the world to have a better future. Education and research at the farm level in aspects of quality control and diversification of cupping profiles will, have, will help them to overcome poverty and help small farmers to become important players in the global industry of coffee. Um, Let's, let's welcome both of them, and, and um, I give you Ruben Sorto. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Uh, thank you, Felipe. And um, um, thank you to the uh, Fermentation Association and to the Specialty Coffee Association as well for the opportunity of uh, sharing with uh, uh, a multinational uh, worldwide audience uh, involved uh, 
Uh, some of us in the coffee industry, some of us in the wine industry, some of us in the, in the food industry. And um, let, me, um, let me share with you uh, some slides about who we are and what we do at the uh, By Fortune Group. Um, and uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to be using um, some slides to um, let me check if uh, if uh, I am able to. Yes, here we are. And by Fortune Group is a, a group of uh, seven different business entities based in Honduras and Guatemala, in Taiwan and in Panama. We are a vertically integrated operation. Uh, from uh, the development of the, um, uh, the genetic material up to the uh, post-harvest processing. We are based uh, in the um, uh, Department of El Paraiso, very near from the honduran Nicaraguan border. And um, we own uh, um, seven different farms uh, um, established at an altitude between 1,200 up to 1,600 meters uh, of altitude. And we... Um, handle 25 different uh, uh, coffee varietals. Um, some of uh, our companies uh, are, um, uh, have been in operation um, for just a few years, but uh, the cornerstone of, uh, our, of uh, how we started of our history uh, started with, uh, with a Fortune uh, specialty coffee farm, which uh, was our first farm. Ruben, excuse me, are you sharing your, your presentation? Because we cannot see any slides. Yes. If Mo can help me handling the, uh, the slides, please, because it seems there is a, some kind of a problem with, uh, with the slides. Instead of me sharing the slides. Yeah, here we are. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the other one. The other one, uh, Mo. The Uh, yeah, that's my presentation, and here we are. And can you move it uh, to the next, uh, to the third slide? Okay, following slide, please. Thank you. Um, some of um, some of our products, and we um, we started uh, with uh, um, just uh, producing coffee, uh, traditional coffee. And uh, conventional coffee uh, was uh, our first target. Uh, in our beginnings, but um, very rapidly we, uh, we um, realized that in order to uh, uh, be successful in, in the market, we needed to um, ramp up and move uh, the bar and move into the specialty coffee production. And so um, after a few years, uh, we started with only one varietal and moved Uh, from one to five varietals and from, from five, uh, now we handle over um, 25 different varietals, uh, 15 of them which uh, are already under production. Uh, we have also realized that um, um, we needed to explore uh, different revenues, uh, different, uh, different uh, streams uh, uh, of revenue, uh, processing not only uh, the, the coffee beans, but uh, processing flowers, leaves, uh, uh, most recently, uh, cascara, which has become so popular in, in, in several markets and which has uh, just uh, uh, recently uh, achieved uh, uh, approval to be used in Europe. And uh, we are currently engaged in several projects to develop um, a cherry pulp uh, products in, Uh, so, uh, so we expect to have several different products uh, during this year and uh, next year. The following slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, um, in order to um, to uh, start the discussion and start the um, the purpose of this webinar, uh, I would like to address. Uh, the two aspects that we have uh, uh, analyzed in our company. We know that in order to um, increase the quality uh, of our product, uh, increase the quality of our, uh, of our coffee, coffee beans, we uh, needed um, 
a complete matrix that could uh, address uh, all the variables, all the factors that affected uh, the quality of coffee, both in the pre-harvest and the post-harvest. So um, uh, from, from that uh, um, perspective, um, we uh, introduced uh, uh, several technologies uh, into our farms uh, using precision agriculture, measuring every single variable about uh, the nutrition of, uh, of our coffee, organic fertilization practices. Uh, we did uh, a complete microbiota mapping with the help of um, the University of Paraná. And uh, uh, here I have to thank and I think that they are, uh, I believe that they're on the audience, both uh, uh, Dao Neto, Dr. Dao Neto and Dr. Gilberto Vinicius de Mello, which have been really instrumental in our, in, in our research and in our uh, business model. Um, the following uh, uh, slide, please. And in the post-harvest, uh, um, um, factors, we realized that fermentation was uh, a, one of uh, the key aspects uh, of uh, the coffee processing that had not been completely addressed because of the limitations that uh, uh, Mario was, uh, was uh, commenting at the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this presentation. Uh, definitely fermentation, uh, to be totally controlled in a, like it is done in other industries, such as beer, dairy, uh, uh, bread production. Um, there, uh, there are important uh, capital investments, uh, specifically on equipment and, te and technology that can help you um, control all the variables involved in the fermentation. Um, so having that in mind, uh, and, and this is something that uh, we will discuss uh, um, uh, during the next couple of minutes, how some of our uh, lessons, how uh, learn how the lessons that we have learned, uh, we could apply them to small producers. The next uh, slide, please. So uh, the first uh, uh, thing that we uh, did was um, in order to understand what we were, uh, what, what we were confronting was, um, we did a complete mapping of uh, the microbiota, all the bacteria and yeasts that are present in our farms. Um, this was uh, um, uh, a very important effort uh, from, from our part and with uh, collaboration, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, Dao and Gilberto. The next uh, slide, please. And what we learned was that um, um, our soil, our water, our coffee trees, our uh, leaves, uh, our cherries had a compendium, a large compendium uh, of uh, bacteria and yeast that were involved in a posterior processes, in posterior fermentation process, in our water. So uh, um, we learned that um, uh, some of these uh, yeast and bacteria were definitely beneficial and were urgently needed in, uh, during the fermentation, but some of them were not. So um, um, in order to offer uh, a, a consistent product to the, to the market, a consistent quality product to the market, we needed to uh, uh, focus on this uh, uh, um, complex array of uh, a, a bacteria and yeast. The following uh, slide, please. Um, I'm, uh, I'm adding a, a piece of information from a uh, yeast genetist, uh, um, uh, Dr. Aime Dudley, uh, which has been quoted in several studies identified that uh, some of the yeast that are commonly identified during uh, the coffee fermentation and uh, uh, as well as in, in cocoa fermentation um, were uh, indigenous to some of our countries. What really surprised me was that uh, Honduras, my homeland, is, uh, is maybe one of the richest places on earth 
for one of the families of uh, the yeast that have been uh, clearly identified as a uh, key for the coffee fermentation, the Saccharomyces family. Next slide, please. And um, uh, we also um, uh, identified that there were some yeast and some bacteria that thrived in our environment. And some of them uh, thrived at the uh, specific altitudes, uh, but this microbiota and, uh, and the prevalence and the dominance of uh, the yeast and bacteria varied depending on the altitude, varied depending on temperature, varied depending on, even on the farms. So uh, um, uh, uh, again, in order to offer a consistent quality product to the market, we needed to reduce variability. Next slide, please. But we also uh, uh, were happily surprised uh, to identify some of the uh, key yeasts and bacteria that have been documented in the literature, in the scientific literature, that uh, uh, produce uh, these uh, um, uh, desired aromas and flavors that everybody wants to have uh, in our coffees. Um, the, the, the Pichia yeast and the Hanseniospora yeast have been extremely uh, well documented and uh, are um, some of the most important yeast that have, clear, have been clearly uh, identified for coffee fermentation. The next slide. Um, and um, um, to summarize, uh, and uh, this is something that uh, I am pretty sure that will open a uh, discussion. We understood that uh, in order to control fermentation, uh, you, uh, we needed to specifically address fermentation, understanding what were the precursors, why, which are the raw materials uh, that differ from varietal to varietal. Uh, you cannot expect to have uh, the same result using a Parainema or a Geisha varietal or even a Marseillesa varietal because of, even though all of them are coffee beans, these are different varietals. Um, I think that a, a friend of ours, Zachary Scott, uh, uh, compared yeast, different uh, Saccharomyces yeast with dogs. Well, comparing different varietals, comparing a geisha uh, to a Marseillesa, even though both of them are coffees, they are different type of uh, 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 raw materials for uh, the microbiota. The microbiota is also a, a, a very important to understand because um, it, it differs from region to region, it differs from altitude to altitude. The, 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 the microbiota at uh, a thousand meters, it's totally different from uh, the microbiota that you will find at 2000 meters. It, the process, the process that uh, Mario was mentioning, having uh, a washed uh, or a fermented uh, coffee, it will vary uh, for, uh, from a honey or from a semi-dry process and, and will also vary to a dry process. And uh, the next slide, please. And I would like, uh, this is, uh, 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 I would like to leave you with this uh, final slide before handling uh, uh, the, the, the next presentation uh, to uh, Felipe. Uh, in order to control the fermentation, in order to understand what was hap what happens during fermentation, you need to be able to monitor and control pH, bricks, temperature, agitation, and uh, uh, even the container. Um, we adapted um, uh, a bioreactor that comes from uh, the wine industry. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, be used uh, for 
coffee berry fermentation. Uh, what we learned was that when you use starter cultures, you can predict the results. You have previsibility from your fermentation as long as you control the parameters and monitor it correctly, which will result in consistency. That's what the market is looking for, consistent results, consistent quality in, 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 a, in, a, in a cup profile. Um, uh, having, using selected uh, and uh, aromatic uh, strains, you will be able to obtain the same results in every single and every different fermentation. And the following slide, please. And, and just uh, as, um, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, as an example of what have been the results of uh, standardizing our um, fermentation processes. The same lot, having the same varietal, the same farm and the same lot, a, a natural uh, fermentation or a natural oxidation uh, gave us a profile which was a, a rich in fruit uh, aromas. It, it smelled, uh, it, it tasted like sugar cane. And, and look at the score, 84.5. That same varietal, that same farm, that same lot through a honey a process, it gave us a, a different uh, a profile and a little bit a higher score. But the huge difference and the big difference comes from a washed or fermented lot inoculated with a specific strain of yeast and with a specific strain of a bacteria that uh, were dominant. The richness uh, and the consistency of the cup profile, as well as the increase in the score is definitely evidence that if you are able to control the fermentation, you are also able to offer a higher quality product, but a consistent quality product. Uh, compared to a washed, uh, a washed coffee without inoculation and done in a traditional uh, cement tank that you will find in uh, most of our farms all over the world. Thank you very much. Your turn, Felipe. Thank you, Ruben. Let's go to Felipe now. Thank you, Ruben. Extremely interesting. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can uh, share my screen right now. Yes, we can Maybe see it. Me? Yeah. Yes. Is that okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's go. Uh, thank you, Mario. Um, uh, hello to everyone. Again, my name is Andres Felipe Ospina. I'm the CEO of Colors of Nature. And I would like to start with a little sentence which says, life is sustained by microbiological ecosystems. Basically, life has started with microbes and is still suspended on microbes. Without them, we cannot eat, we cannot produce food and ecosystems, basically superior animals and plants won't be able to exist. Colors of Nature earns, owns La Cereza Research Center. Uh, it is a small farm that is located in Huila department in the south of Colombia and um, this small facility has pretty much everything that you need to research in fermentation and to start to understand. So we have very basic equipment, but we have been utilizing that for more than 10 years to understand what's happening with fermentation. Basically what we do, everything that we do at La Cereza is research. Everything that we do is experimental. We can basically, um, mm, process about 200 tons of coffee uh, per harvest. And those 200 tons of uh, coffee cherries are used to research. We produce naturals, we produce wash, we produce honeys, and we produce some combination between different um, processing. 
At La Cereza, we do something similar to what uh, Ruben does. Basically, we monitor and we control as much as we can, uh, temperature, oxygen, the amount of sugar that the fruit has. Um, we control the light. We control uh, the amount of CO2 that we can have in one bioreactor and so on. And through many years, we have been doing this. It has given us some experience. And after having some experience, we understood that even if we control some of those parameters, what is more important was to understand what was the role of each microorganism that was involved in the fermentation. As we start to see that, we start to also isolate different microbes. This is our main research line right now. We, will, we are isolating local microbes and we are testing all of them in coffee. We have about 15 different varietals of coffee and we are basically doing um, testing every day on different varieties, different temperatures, different times, different microorganisms all based in replication, because we need to understand what is the replicability, what, is, what we can recap, repi, uh, replicate and what we cannot replicate. Here we have some examples of the microorganisms that we have been uh, isolating. Most of these pictures are going to be from yeast. Um, as we can see here, we have different kind of patterns. These are micro uh, cultures. We grow these so we can use them um, into fermentation directly without growing them previously. So we have also developed systems in which we can isolate these microorganisms and keep them alive from one harvesting season to the next one. And the idea is that we have been doing this so we can also transfer this uh, knowledge to farmers. We can see here other kind of strains and other kind of uh, microorganisms Something that is very interesting about this is like they have particular, for example, smell, as well as we can see here, different textures and different configurations. They also have different smell. Most of them smell amazing. They smell like fruits. They are very floral. It's quite interesting. And every time you come and open one of them, you start to wonder what is what they are going to be able to do to coffee. We also can see different kinds of colors and um, yeah, we just start to explore in all of them. So what we are using them is we are doing like some um, wet fermentations, we are doing some uh, dry fermentations, we are doing natural, honey's washed. Through doing this, we have basically mapped what is the outcome in the, outcome in the cup of each microorganism in different times and what is what they do to the cup of each of those varieties. And we came out with something that we call dynamic fermentation. What dynamic fermentation is, is basically um, an answer to two different things. One was that we wanted to replicate um, wild fermentation. Why? Because for me and my under, and in my appreciation, wild fermentation is the ultimate expression of the terroir. And it's very important for us the terroir, because the terroir produce unique coffees. The thing is that we don't understand wild fermentation yet, and, but I'm very against demonizing wild fermentation. Why? Because we have seen hundreds and hundreds of outstanding, amazing coffees from all over the world that have been produced with wild fermentation. One of the things is that maybe we cannot replicate them, but wild fermentation also has very positive things. So what we do with dynamic fermentation is that we start to combine different microorganisms that usually act in different times during the fermentation in order to add different layers of flavor to the coffee. This has helped us enormously to produce coffees that are consistently over 88 points and some of them are even over 91 points, which is very interesting. Also with our replicability that is over 75%. We still are not 100% there because we don't control some, some vari variations. And I think also because some of the strains work different in different varieties. So, but we still don't have a biochemical mapping of them to understand. But we know the result in the cup, but we don't have a biochemical screening of each of the coffees. And also because we have hundreds of them. So, 
Dynamic fermentation can be applied for naturals, can be applied for honeys, can be applied for washed coffees, and can be applied in um, fermentations that are private, private of oxygen, without oxygen, and uh, so we don't have any kind of oxidation, and some fermentations that are also in presence of oxygen, where some oxidation is going on. So it's very interesting to see how, how they, they work. And what we have get so far is very interesting in terms of the cup. We have coffees, for example, when we do some alcoholic fermentations, we have coffees that uh, resemble whiskey, cognac, champagne, um, uh, sangria, beer, black beer, you know, so many different kinds of variations that we can obtain with this. This is showing us that the potential is humongous. And when we do lactic fermentations or fermentations that are private of oxygen, we also have seen a lot of different fruits, like some particular microorganisms can produce some particular notes, but also when we involve them, we can see more complexity. So we have some coffees that, for example, resemble banana or mango, papaya, uh, grapefruits, and some of them that, that also resemble as um, cacao nibs and some chocolates, the nickel chocolates and so on. So it's very interesting to see what is the potential when we start to mix different microorganisms in one fermentation. Another thing that we have come up with this because it was very important for us to explain to our clients what was happening with this is with a sensory kit. This kit is designed so our customers, which are mostly roasters, can understand what is happening to the coffee with different processes because we cannot Coffees, like, like the biochemistry of the, of the beans change so much that we have to roast the coffee differently. We cannot do the same roasting to each coffee because then we are not going to find the maximum potential of those coffees. And then we, we see now that the roasting world also has to adapt to the processing. Same Coppers can use this kind of sensory kit to understand what's happening with fermentation and what does fermentation do to the coffee. But even if we are producing such an amazing coffees that are so different one to another, we have faced so big challenge during this time. Let's see a little bit about our reality and also the reality of small holders. The first ones will be food safety. As Ruben was saying, food safety is one of the biggest concerns of the market right now because we know some microorganisms can produce ocratoxin or toxins that are not good for us and also, and also all flavors and defects to the cup. So in how do we do that in a small farm? How do we, how do we deal with that when we don't have the means, when we don't have um, like bioreactors that we can um, disinfect every time that we use them and so on? So what we do is basically take a very basic uh, a safety uh, um, precautions like using gloves, for example, is something important at the farm level because we know also hands are vector of different kind of bad bacteria and, and microorganisms. The other thing is what we do when we have bioreactors or containers that are not uh, appropriate because they have, um, they contain bacteria and they contain different microorganisms from the past. So we have found solutions as for example, using Grade Pro or using Ecotac bags that are new. And once you have disinfected your beans, once you have inoculated them, you can put them in these kind of bags and it's going to protect your fermentation, make your real fermentation. It's going to avoid cross-contamination with other microorganisms and it's going to keep your fermentation safe. So these are some of the, the, the measures that you can take as a farmer to, to increase the food safety in your, um, in your farm. The other one, the other big challenge that we have is how to escalate production and how to keep the cost low. Because one of the things is when you use, for example, one microorganism in one particular process or three different processes in one particular batch, and you try to understand what's happening with the cupping. But another thing is when you're going to start to produce micro lots or when you're going to produce bigger commercial units. This is a big challenge for the industry right now. But I think once you start to, under, uh, to isolate those, those microorganisms and control some of the variables, then you can start to have 
more replicability, and at the same time produce bigger and bigger lots. So this is something that can be solved, even for small uh, 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 coffee farmers. The other challenge with, that we have right now for, for small holders is education, technology, and innovation. Well, education, because we don't have many places to, want to, to be educated right now. So for example, at La Cereza, we have constantly farmers coming to study and we give them what we have understand during, during all these years and they go back to their places, they start to applicate this. And also we give them some uh, advice about how they can work without uh, a big technology or with the technology that they have. But we know that we need to in innovate in technology. The thing is the cost, the cost is very high and the prices of the, of the coffee are very depressed for many years. So it means that we have very uh, few amount of money left to invest in these kind of things. So this is one actually one of the biggest um, challenges that we have, which is technology and innovation, and it's basically a, an, a, an economical limit. The other challenge that we have is the challenge that small farmers um, face all the time and also communities. But through education, we, we have seen and we have good examples of them starting to understand how to ferment their coffee, how to process their coffee, even if they have uh, facilities that they have been using for a long time, you can still implement and do some small transformations that are, go are going to help you to handle to your customer a better coffee and actually build your brand. So we have seen this with dozens and, and more and more increasing number of farmers that work with us, where they are building their own brand and it's becoming very popular and the quality is going up. Because usually when a farmer is similar to what happens in Honduras, a farmer usually can produce 84, 85 points uh, in cup. But when they start to do this, then it starts to go like 87, 88 points. Even some of them have um, in past 90 points. We have seen some of our farmers already being present in Cup of Excellence every year, and it's something that is very interesting for us. And the last challenge that we face with this is the, how to be more environmentally friendly with tropical fermentation. And here, I want to just point something which is the overwhelming reality that coffee processing industry uh, is facing in tropics. Basically, we are not very eco-friendly. Everybody knows that we um, dispose large amount of water that is polluted, the, uh, the biological demand of oxygen is huge, and this has a huge impact in, in, in mainly the water. So we need to approach these issues more. And also we need to approach right now another issue, which is to protect the biodiversity, the local biodiversity of microorganisms. Why? Because local ecosystems are based in that local community of microorganisms through millions of years. They've been coexisting and they've been shaping each other. The industry, um, sadly, I will say, is facing one reality, which is the introduction of subtropical strains of microorganisms to produce better cup. Well, there are different things. One, one of the things here is like, we may not need them because we have a huge diversity of microorganisms that act actually can behave and have the potential to behave very good with fermentation when we, when, once we isolate them and produce outstanding and amazing coffees that the market for sure is going to value. The other thing is just, just going a little bit, if we, if we bring these strains, because um, they have different ecosystems, they come from different ecosystems, I think the scientific evidence has shown the the disaster that is to introduce uh, foreign species into one ecosystem. We don't understand yet our tropical ecosystem, micro, my, microbiological ecosystems. Most of the research that we have done in micro um, um, organisms is from temperate areas. So we don't know yet what is the complexity in the tropical areas, but we, we can expect that there is a lot of complexity on this and, and they are probably more based in cooperation and coexistence rather than high rates of competition. So if we bring foreign strains, uh, I think we have to be very careful with that because, uh, well, we can cause something that we don't know where it go, where is it, where it, what, what is gonna go and maybe some of the local species can be affected and maybe we can also affect the, the, the balance of the microorganisms. And just put in an, an, an example is like, what if we, for example, bring all these um, commercial strains 
and we apply them everywhere, well, coffee is going to start to taste the same everywhere. And one of the other things is those strains are not going to show the potential of the terroir. The potential of the terroir of each farmer is basically their little treasure. They can actually produce very, very different coffees, coffees that the market has not seen yet. And it's thanks to the terroir and thanks to that, that biodiversity. So I guess our step is to, to understand that, to understand what is the role of each one of those microorganisms, start to understand how we can use them in fermentation and how we can uh, help small uh, coffee farmers to use them and produce outstanding coffees. So this, this is basically uh, our research so far. Thank you for, for listening to us and let's go to the questions. Thank, thank you very much, Felipe. And, and thank you for staying up at 2 a.m. in the morning for you. So I have, I have a, a couple questions I curated from, from the audience uh, and time permitting after those two questions, we, we will go to the live uh, chat questions with Amelia. So the first question for both of you is about starter cultures. Um, so what are the pros and cons of using starter, starter cultures regarding quality, cost, technical requirements, and the environmental impact? Uh, native or commercial starters? Yeast, lactic, and acid bacteria, or what, what kind of microbial population? And I know that this this question has partially been answered by, by both of you, but I, I, I want to compare and contrast both of your opinions about um, microbial starters, namely commercial microbial starters, and what kind of microbial population behaves the best in your experience. Uh, let's start with Ruben. Um, thank you, thank you, Mario. Um... We have uh, we have been able to uh, use uh, some commercial starters, um, which I must say there are not many uh, for in the market, uh, specifically uh, to be used in coffee. If we compare the, the 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 commercial starters available for the wine industry, uh, typically you can find maybe. 70, 80 different strains, uh, different yeasts, different bacteria. And if you look at how many we have available for coffee, there may be three or four and that's it. So the, um, the, uh, the available uh, material to work with, it, it's uh, quite limited. It, it took a lot of years, um, even decades for the wine industry to reach that level of uh, complexity uh, with regards to starters. And I believe that uh, uh, with coffee, it won't take us that, that long because we are going to um, take advantage of that experience coming from other industries, either from the wine or from the brewery industry or even from the dairy industry. So I would expect that in the coming years, we're going to uh, start uh, looking at more and more um, uh, options. Having said that, um, uh, with regard to, to commercial, what we have uh, observed uh, it's that um, if, if you start with um, low scores with coffees that um, uh, have room for improvement uh, with regards to scores, uh, you will definitely see uh, 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 a, a big uh, uh, increase, a substantial increase, uh, maybe three, four, or, or even five points. Um, uh, but if you already have a very good uh, uh, coffee, a very good varietal, a very good process, um, maybe that improvement is not as uh, anyone would expect to be. Um, the, the ones that we have used, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have um, observed uh, and we have experienced uh, both uh, uh, results, uh, uh, big leaps and very small improvements. Uh, having, having also said that, and I know that that was not part of the question, but uh, I just want to 
highlight that uh, the best results that we have uh, obtained have been with uh, native uh, um, starters, with um, local terroirs, local microbiota. And this is where I think that uh, Felipe and I will meet and, and, and uh, find common ground. Felipe. <laughs> Thank you, Roland. Well, Mario, I, 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 I must say I've been against using commercial strains um, from the beginning, um, more because in my perception, they come from places that are not tropical places. And also because what I'm saying, I'm afraid of what is the implication of them once you release them. Because well, let's, let's face the reality, even for example, if we have a, a water plant treatment in, in at La Cereza, most of farmers don't have that kind of stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I will set up a bad example if I start to do it. But I have been um, uh, capping them in, in, in different countries. And well, to say, um, I think that I, with the coffees that I have tried, honestly, I think they are good. They are, they are clean cupped. They are coffee um, that are sweet and that they may have some particular note. But I think at the same time, they lack of complexity. They, they like, as we say in Japan, a punch. They don't have the strength to go farther in the cup. So that's one, that's one of the, my points. I, I, what was the point to use them when we don't have that? It's better that we put more effort into, as Rowan said, using local strains, because we have seen with local strains that we can produce first more unique things, yes? And the other thing is like somehow it, it, it enhance, enhance the terroir. It shows more uniqueness uh, to me. You, you can see that when you isolate uh, even one single microorganism, um, you, you can explore a, a lot of different things in, in, from that terroir in different process, right? They don't behave the same in different kind of process. One same microorganism can be very good for naturals, but it's not as good for wash, for example. So I think we can play with them. We, we still are the, at Portus to start to know more about them. And the other thing is when we use starters that are local, which we have one advantage is we can mix several different microorganisms and produce something that even comes better. Thank you. One more question for the both of you. So how can smallholder producers with no means to invest in fermentation equipment benefit from the technical knowledge about coffee fermentation? Would controlled fermentation bring higher costs for smallholder farmers? Would it bring higher prices? What's, what's your view about how to replicate this at a, at a mass scale to, to smallholder producers? Um, let's, and let's start this time with, with Felipe. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I see a lot of advantages. I think um, I think for all of us that we are in science, um, we, we, it's a dream to have something like Ruben has. Yes. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have some, uh, we have experience with some um, uh, uh, bioreactors. Actually, the dynamic fermentation also came at the beginning because we built a bioreactor that mixes the coffee because one of the, the, the the problems that we have is basically that we have kind of different layers in one container and the bottom doesn't behave the same as the top of the coffee. So we, we, we were with that question, how we can improve that. But that's another issue. But, but talking about uh, small farmers, I think um, right now we, what we have been doing is we have been using, as I said in the presentation, uh, things that, are, uh, that we can pass to small holders to use in the farm level. So as long as you have even plastic bags that are clean, they are cheap, they are reusable, you can have good level of isolation. For example, you can even isolate from oxygen and avoid uh, uh, oxidation in your fermentation if you want to control it, right? Um, so I, I think like there are means and, and the farmers, uh, even with very simple things, can have very good results. Um, I, I, and, and then again, I go to the point, what, what the most important point here is, is to understand what is what we are going to use for the fermentation. And that's when the, I think the bottleneck of all of this becomes, are we going to be able to isolate microorganisms or not? And that's what we are working on. 
helping them to isolate those microorganisms. Thank you, Ruben. Um, I think that uh, um, a translating a science and technology to small uh, farmers with very little investment um, will um, help them uh, increase not only the possibility of a higher income, uh, because if you are not able to control fermentation, you are risking uh, the effort of a, a one-year uh, harvest. Uh, if you are not able to identify the end uh, of the fermentation, if you are not able to identify that below a, a four pH, you will start producing acetic acid. You will start producing vinegar. And uh, uh, the cup profile uh, is going to deteriorate and that uh, small farmer will receive a less, uh, 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 a lower price because it's, uh, the, that coffee will uh, present the defects that any copper, that any roaster, that any exporter will be able to identify. And that has been a, uh, a major problem in, in our countries, um, not knowing where is the beginning point of the fermentation and where it ends. Uh, when I um when I say a, a very little investment, um, a, a, a pocket a, a pH meter and a, a refractometer, uh, which may be an investment of around a hundred dollars. A uh, hundred dollars is it's. It's an investment, but it's still small. Uh, uh, these two uh, small instruments uh, uh, open uh, the eyes of uh, a small uh, a farmer uh, to know where is the starting point of his fermentation and where he has to stop it. He has to stop it when there is no when there are no more sugars when there, are, uh, there is no more food for microorganisms. Um, that, uh, that is measured with the refractometer. And the other uh, variable that uh, the small uh, farmer can measure is the pH. Uh, the, the, the threshold, that, the, the limit that I would establish would be a, a four point limit. Because below that, you're starting in a, in a risk area where you can have undesirable flavors. And definitely, um, it's a matter of uh, if we are able to translate this knowledge to the small farmer, he will definitely receive a higher income, a higher price. Thank you so much, both of you. So, Amelia, let's go with you. And um, you manage the time. <laughs> yes, that's. I have just a just a few questions. First, thank you guys so much. You've really, uh, you know, very thoroughly demonstrated how innovative coffee producers need to be to create this delicious, sustainable coffee that helps small farmers. This has been a really great discussion. Um, my first question: We had a few people asking about disinfecting the coffee cherries. How do you do that in a way that doesn't, you know, leave trace amounts in the coffee and impact the fermentation? Let's, Felipe, should we, can we start with you? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, there are different, uh, different um, things that we can do to disinfect water, uh, cherries, um, but they are costly, some of them. So we, I guess we, we, we that, that's one of the, the, the challenges we face there as well. Um, in our case, the most, um, the, the one that we use the most is a, a oxide peroxide, peroxide. Mario, is that the correct name in English? Uh, like, oh, like um, peroxide, yes. Yeah, yeah. peroxide, yeah. How about, how about oxygen? Yeah. So, Hydrogen peroxide. Uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, thank you. So we, we use it, um, it's a little bit expensive, but it, 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 it has very good results for us in the past. Um, and the other one that we use is alcohol. Alcohol is also good. So when we are doing 
an alcoholic fermentation where you may use alcohol, yeah? And when we are going to do another one is um, oxid peroxide. There are some, um, um, I mean, very wild, uh, wide use, uh, which is uh, saline water, for example. So you put water with salt in some concentration, but what we have get with uh, with that is is not very is not very good. Usually, what we get with that kind of coffees, it, our coffee is very complex, not very complex, maybe 80, 80, 84 points or something like that. So we actually uh, use the other ones. The other ones is um, you you can uh, use, for example. Uh, ozone, but uh, the question is the uh, ozonizers are not available in the market. Um, I know there are there, there is a friend of mine, um, actually I was in one of his courses um, from Cuba Biotech um, in, in Cauca, in Popayan. And, uh, and um, uh, yeah, amazing experience what they have doing also uh, uh, fermentations and uh, pro, uh, transforming coffee. And, and they, they have the, the means to create a, like a, an a ozonizer, uh, which also will help and will be more easy, I guess, and costly wise will be the best way to do it. We don't have it yet, but maybe in the future we will have it. So there are different ways uh, to go around that. What is more important, I will say, I, I mean, you can use also, for example, chlorine, but uh, one of the things is like, um, some residuals may, may, may stay there. That's why peroxide is better, I guess, because we don't have residual, it becomes water at the end. Yeah, and alcohol will be incorporated also in the, in the fermentation and you can wash it away. But having like, like basic things, like for example, use um, water that has been boiled, for example, is something that can help you if you have a, a little amount of, of coffee, at least to reduce the initial microbiological charge. Of, of, of the coffee mass. Ruben, what about you? Any, any other thoughts to that? Um, well, uh, I am against using a, a, any chemical that can um, provide uh, a, any, a, any aroma, any flavor uh, into the cherries. Uh, so uh, I would discard uh, using any chlorine uh, products. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, in our beginnings, we started with a, a very simple disinfection system of uh, uh, one of the most important variables uh, in order to have a clean and food safe process, water. If you're able to treat your water with um, um, a, a carbon filter, a sand filter, you will eliminate uh, two main contamination variables, uh, suspended solids, and um, a, a, you will be able to eliminate uh, any odor uh, sources uh, through the carbon filter. Uh, on the final stage, you can use a, a UV lamp to uh, totally uh, uh, eliminate all the, the microbial load from the water. So you so you are able to uh, uh, wash your cherries with a totally potable, clean water. That's the best disinfection that you can uh, provide uh, uh, the coffee cherries on your initial post-harvest process. If you're able to uh, uh, wash your cherries, you will be able to uh, reduce the microbial load and you will also eliminate potential uh, sources of contamination, which will affect the cup uh, profile and which will affect, of course, the fermentation process, the, uh, the, the posterior fermentation process. Um, we started using that on, a, on, an open, um, on, a, on an open typical wet mill, which was uh, our initial installation. Uh, our beginnings were just as, hum as humble as uh, any, uh, everybody else's. Uh, uh, and uh, my second recommendation uh, to uh, reduce contamination would be to close uh, the mill uh, to uh, 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 prevent uh, uh, other sources of contamination from, from the environment, from, from animals, from uh, uh, all sources of the uh, uh, nearby the, the wet mill. Thank you for that. Okay, my, my last question. We had a question come through. You know, Mario mentioned at the beginning how 
many people don't understand coffee is fermented. I know we've talked with him about this. Uh, you know, when we've met with him with the fermentation association that many people say, that's not fermented. It would taste like wine or like kombucha if you fermented a coffee. Many people are confused about it. Have you found a way to explain to your customers an easy way to explain that that coffee bean fermentation process or a post harvesting harvesting fermentation process. Ruben, let's let's start with you this time. Um, uh, the best way in which uh, we have been able to uh, to uh, uh, tell our story, it, it's uh, uh, the cup. If you are, if they are on my last slide, I was showing the same varietal. I, I, I lead them to the evidence. This is a natural coffee. This is a honey coffee. And this is a coffee that was fermented on a traditional wet mill. And this is a coffee that was fermented under controlled conditions. And they can taste the difference and know that um, uh, through fermentation, they were a we were able to uh, uh, enhance and produce using the same raw material, using the same coffee beans, you can have different flavor profiles and they can taste and try that cup and uh, sense the difference and smell the difference. And uh, 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 so, uh, so the cup speaks for itself. And in that way, they know that the fermentation process is a value adding stage, a critical stage for the coffee industry. And we were discussing this with Mario uh, uh, minutes before the, uh, we started uh, uh, the webinar. And uh, some, uh, some years ago, the fermentation and the post-harvest uh, processes were just overlooked like uh, uh, a functional uh, stage uh, for doing the pulping, for doing uh, the emulsifying from uh, drying, but uh, we were not able to uh, uh, tell a story or present an argument under which we could say, this adds value well. Fermentation adds value and controlled fermentation adds value and it can change um, uh, the livelihoods of uh, uh, the 26 million uh, people that uh, uh, are in, involved in this industry around the world. Thank you. So important. Get the, get the cup in their hands, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, Felipe, what about you? Any other thoughts? Um, well, I, I, I guess uh, from my perspective, uh, I mean, I, most of my customers are in, in Asia and, and I think the, the, the amount of fermented food that they have um, is extremely, um, yeah, they have a lot of variations. Pretty much it's, it's kind of easy to, it's difficult to find something that is not fermented <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I, I guess here is easy to explain, but um, I, I think I face actually more um, problems with the uh, uh, with farmers, um, they've been producing it, but they don't understand what is it. They 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 know that they they just need to take the mucilage out, but they don't understand that that's a fermentation and that's actually a process that you can control and that you can start to understand and produce better coffee. So one of the things that has become very valuable to us and especially to them when they come to us for education is to have like cupping sessions where they can see how a natural taste, um, how a honey tastes, how a, a wash coffee taste, you know? And they will say, uh, but why, why this one um, tastes like this or like that? And then you can explain and elaborate a lot on that, you know? And also about the defects of over fermenting coffee, um, which is one of the things that they don't, they may not understand easily why over fermentation can cause a defect in the coffee. But once they taste it, they, they, at the beginning, they, that's the one they like the most <laughs> because it's, it's kind of, you know, like in our countries, usually we, we left the worst of the coffee for ourselves. So people is more used to that. But once they start to learn about what is a clean coffee, you know, what is not over fermented, what is free of defects, they start to identify that and they start to like and drink the best coffee they have in their farm and so on. So I guess, yes, it's more of a challenge for me in that side uh, so far. 
Mario, Ruben, Felipe, thank you so much for teaching us today. This has been just a really fascinating discussion. And thank you for all of you for attending today's webinar. Um, a special thank you to the Specialty Coffee Association for partnering with us today for this webinar. We will post a recording of today's webinar on CFA's website in the next 24 hours. Uh, and also, registration is open for the Fermentation Association's first live in-person conference in November called Fermentation 2021. We hope you will join us. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to get your ticket. Uh, and while you're there, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Instagram account. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you Thank so much, you. everybody. Thank you. Gracias, Ruben y Felipe. Gracias, Mario and Emilia. And more and new. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.